Hashem Nasev and Atzliach. Shul Torah. Wonderful to be here at Shorashim. Thank you for having me, Baruch Hashem. My name is Yaron Reuven, and uh, I'm here to learn with you. So, one of the uh, a lot of people have heard Baruch Hashem. Thousands and thousands of people all over the world have heard my personal story of why I left Wall Street and decided to be a mezakeh um, rabim, someone that goes out there to different places to get Am Yisrael to do tshuva. If you give me a napkin, please. I have water all over the place. Okay. Uh, get Am Yisrael to do tshuva, to wake up. You know, they uh, say that if... Oh, thank you. They say that if someone... Chas v'shalom. Chas v'shalom. If someone loses consciousness, first, they give him CPR. They try to give him mouth-to-mouth, try to do something to wake him up. Get him out of his, uh, get him out of his situation, because he's sleeping. But it's not a healthy sleep. But if that doesn't work, if that doesn't work, if the mouth to mouth doesn't work, the CPR doesn't work, the next thing they do is they hit his heart and they slap him in the face a few times. You gotta wake him up. Guy drowned. You have to slap him a few times. They have to wake him up. Because if he stays asleep, he's not going to wake up. Hashem at him. If that doesn't work, they have to go bring the ambulance. going to have to put an electric shock. Electric shock. I think these are devices they put on his chest. And shock him back to life, hopefully. They electrocute him. In order to help him come back to life. It hurts a lot. If you do it to a person that's not sleeping, it hurts a lot. If they're sleeping, it could save their life. If it doesn't work, then you call Chivra Kadisha. They say bye. We see that in our tefillah, Hashem constantly says that He's trying to wake us up. He's trying to wake us up, but we're all awake. We're all here, Baruch Hashem. We're laughing, we're joking, we're Enjoying, we're eating, we're drinking, we're playing soccer, we're playing the stock market. Everybody's awake. What's the, what do you mean, wake? Awake meaning spiritually awake. Awake meaning understanding what's the point. Why are you here? Every human being goes through a, several stages of his life. And at some point he has to ask himself, what's the point? Why am I here? If I'm here to make money, then why are there poor people in the world? Meaning, I'm assuming you all believe in God. If you believe in God, then that means God is smarter than you. So God put you in the world for a reason. He didn't just put you in the world just to go play soccer. He didn't put you in the world just to go to the stock market. He didn't put you in the world just to uh, read uh, some Harry Potter books. He put you in the world for a reason. And there has to be both a universal reason, meaning a reason for all of mankind, and it has to be a personalized reason. Why are you here? So everybody has to go through their life, sometimes when you're 15, sometimes when you're 25, sometimes when you're 50. Point is, you always have to ask yourself, why are you here? What's the point? If it was just for money, if Hashem put everybody in the world just to make money, then why are there poor people? There's a flaw in the system. If Hashem made people come to the world just to get married, then why are there so many people that are single? Why are there people that get divorced? The whole point is to be married. Why are you getting divorced? You're doing the opposite. If the point is to have children, then why are there so many people that can't have kids? And so on and so forth, for all of the physical things in the world, you see that there's no way that any of that is the point. There's no way that any of that is the point. I thought at one point, when I was a teenager, I was your age, I thought my point of life was to be a football player. I used to play football in high school, and I was very passionate about it. And for the first couple of years, I was pretty good. And then after I joined the varsity team, I was no longer good because they're all three times my size. Each one was Amalek, his brother, Goliath, his brother, and I'm this little Jewish guy. So it didn't work out for me. My dream didn't work out for me. Later on, when I was 18 years old, I decided that I didn't want to go to college anymore, even though I was a very good student. I decided that I wanted to go into the work world. I was already working since I was a teenager, since I was maybe 10 years old. I always had money, I always had jobs, I had two newspaper routes. 
worked for a shoe store, worked for a clothing store, worked for electronic stores. By the time I was 17, I was already making $100,000 a year. So money was not necessarily a, uh, something that uh, I didn't know about or discovered later on in my life. I was a hustler. I made money. I worked really, really hard. While the rest of my friends went to bars and, and hung out with girls all day, I went and made money. And I wanted to be a millionaire because I thought that's my goal. I thought to be a millionaire, that's a good goal to have. Somebody asked me, what do you, do with, what do you want to do when you grow up? I said, I want to make millions. He goes, yeah, but what do you want to do? I said, I don't care. I just want to make millions. Yes? Uh, when I was 17 years old, I, had, uh, I was working in the electronics business. Hmm? What is it? It wasn't so styled. Oh, maybe. Uh, it was an electronics business selling computers. And it was, at the, in those times, there was still money to be made in the business. There was still money to be made in the business. Not like today, where you pretty much buy a computer for 300 bucks. What age were you making? 100,000? 17. How did you make 100,000? I was a very, very good salesman. I was a very, very good. I was a very good salesman. Um, but in addition to that, I also did other things. I also did other things on the uh, whatever I could to make money. But most it, mostly, I was not planning on being in that business forever because I realized that the only way for me to make my dream money, which is millions, was to own the store. And I hated the business. I hated uh, selling computers. I hated working for people. So I didn't want to do it. I, just, I did it at that time because it was a good way to make money. So I went to college. I went to one year of college. I went to Binghamton University, which was a top state school in New York. I had a nearly a perfect GPA, which means really good. And uh, I was planning on becoming a psychiatrist. I liked helping people. I liked talking, as you can see. And uh, I had a decent brain. But then after the first year... I realized that in order for me to be a psychiatrist or an accountant or a lawyer or a doctor or anything that's going to make millions, I have to be in school for millions of years. I have to be in school forever. I have to go to college. College, you know, today college is like high school. You waste the first four years, you waste three and a half of them. And then only the last semester you actually discover what you want to do. The first three and a half years you're really busy drinking. Drinking, hanging out with girls and stuff like that. It was a complete waste of time. All of the other kids would smoke pot all day and drink and so on and, and, and do nothing. Me, I was already in the business world at that time. I didn't want to be a loser. So I realized college is not for me. I want to go make money. So I decided to leave school and go back to selling electronics, but then I realized that I hated it even more when I came back to it, so I wanted to look for something else. A friend of mine was in the car business, so I asked him, okay, maybe I could start selling cars. So I went to uh, this car shop in, uh, in New York, and uh, I arranged a meeting. I'm 18 years old at this time, and I uh, met with the uh, manager, and I asked him, okay, before we sit down and I spend any of your time, what does your top guy make? Meaning your number one salesman, what does he make? He said, oh, maybe around $150,000, $160,000. I said, okay, thank you, I'm not interested. He said, what do you mean you're not interested, son? I said, I'm not interested, I'm not interested in the job. He goes, why not? It's a lot of money. I said, yes, for him it's a lot of money. For me, it's not because if I'm, more, I'm making 100000 now, if he's making 150, 160, that means he's been here for at least five years. You can't just make 150 just walking in. So that means I'm going to wait another five years just to make another 50%. It's not for me. He was very, very confused at my logic, but he agreed with it. And I left. So then my friend called me crazy. And he told me, uh, I think you could have gotten a good job over there, but uh, what do you want? I said, I want to make millions. He said, there's only other, one thing that you can do to make that kind of money, and you can do what I'm trying to do. What are you trying to do? He said, I'm a stockbroker. I said, okay. I know what stockbrokers are. I had a few dollars, so I started investing in the market. I just didn't know you could do it without going to school. So I said, okay, get me a job. Got me an interview. I went to this place in New York, and I got the interview, and the guy says, uh, okay, listen, first, since you don't really know much, you don't have a license, and so on and so forth, first you have to pay the dues. First, you have to pretty much do whatever we tell you. You have to make phone calls. You have to get us coffee. You have to do all the wonderful things that no one else wants to do. Okay, fine. And then we're going to teach you how to actually sell stocks, how to research, and so on and so forth. Okay, fine. How much do I make? He says, you make a huge amount. Only 250 bucks a week. That's $1,000 a month. That's a lot less than I was making. I'm taking a 90% pay cut. I said, deal. Why did I say deal? Because I looked at the parking lot and I looked at the employees there and everybody had a nice car. 
a car that costs a lot of money. And I said, okay, so something must be doing. They're doing something right here. They're doing something right. I'm getting a job. Okay, I'm going to start at a thousand bucks a month. But obviously, they're not making a thousand bucks a month if each guy has a car. It's worth two hundred thousand. So I got the job. And I started seeing how Wall Street kind of works, and I saw that people are making a good amount of money, but it takes a while. The first firm didn't really work out for me because they were criminals, and I don't like criminals. And I left after a few months. Well, actually, I got fired because I didn't want to do what they want me to do. And uh, I went to another firm. And a long story short, because we don't have that much time, I worked for other people for the first three years. First three years of the business, the most I made per month was somewhere around $1,500, $1,400 for the month. But now, my schedule is very different. My schedule started, I started work, or I started my day, somewhere around 6.30 in the morning, got to the office by 8, worked till 8 o'clock at night, went home, which is another hour travel, and then studied for the Series 7 test to get a license to actually become one of the guys that's actually making real money. First three years in the business, I'm just paying my dues. Pretty much, I'm doing all the work, they're making all the money. My boss was making a fortune, and one of the ways I knew was because he was buying jewelry for my family and had a brand new car and a brand new house and a brand new this and a brand new that, and he was making $100,000, $200,000 a month. So I knew I was in the right direction, it's just that at some point I had to break this $1,000 threshold I was on. So after three years, I realized that this boss is taking advantage of me. I left. I went to another firm, a firm called Raymond James, which is a well-known firm in the industry. I worked there for a few months with under uh, a uh, false belief that the guy I was working with was going to be my partner. After a few months, I realized he's not a partner, he's just a thief, and the partnership broke up. And I told the manager of the office, the guy that owned the place, listen, I... Uh, don't want to be partners with anyone. I want to be independent within your office. He says, okay, that's a good idea. I like you. You're a nice guy. But the problem is, to be independent, you have to come up with four to $5,000 a month. And I said, for what? He said, for the rent, for the secretary, for the stuff, for the stuff, for the stuff, and more stuff. Meaning, he has to make money for me regardless of whether I make money or not. He has to make at least $60,000 a year. He says, do you have it? I said, no. He says, how are you going to pay me? I said, I don't know. But if I'm going to go to another place, I'm going to go through this whole story again. Just give me an opportunity and I'll do it. I'll get you the money. He said, okay, what is your intentions here? What's your point? What are you trying to do? And me, little 21-year-old kid with a little cuckoo, a ponytail, he asked me, this guy that's been in the business for almost 20 years asks me, what's your intentions here? And my answer immediately was to buy you out. I was very bold. And I was a very hard worker, and I really believed what I was saying. Called naive, called arrogant, doesn't make a difference. My goal was to buy him out. I, he said, let me think about it. He got back to me after a few days. He said, okay, you can become independent within the firm. And I started. I started making a few phone calls, and then September 11th happened, a few days later. September 11th happened just literally a few days after I became independent, which is, according to everybody else at that time, was the worst time in the world. The market just crashed, the U.S. economy plummeted, the dot-com bubble burst even more, and so on and so forth. All hell broke loose in so many words. For me, that was the market opportunity. Why? No one was happy with their broker. If no one's happy with their broker, maybe I have an opportunity. You look at every, everyone else's failure as a down is something that's negative then you'll fail just like them if you look at every failure as an opportunity you can succeed in life and that's what i did and i realized that i can't have i can't just inherit 20 years worth of experience overnight the fact still is that i'm only in it for three years and the average guy that's making real money is in it for 20 years i can't just get 20 years worth of experience overnight but i can do something else what can i do i can work more than anyone else they work 9 to 5 on the average. They work 9, 10 hours a day, maybe. I could work more. So I figured if I start my day at around 5.30, I can get to the office at 6.30, I could do all the research I need to do by 8, work till midnight, because at midnight, it's at that point I can't make any more phone calls anymore to California and other states. 
But at midnight, I could stop working because at that point, usually my ear will start falling off and I can't make any more phone calls. At midnight, I get on the bus, get back home. By the time I got home, it's around 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, fall asleep for a couple of hours and go back to work the next day. Sounds like a plan, no? Kind of hard, though. Easier to say than done, but we did it. And I went to work, and every day when I would come home, I'd see these guys that lived around the block for me, hang out, you know, smoking cigarettes, beer, uh, and uh, marijuana, and everything else in between, asking me, why am I walking around, where am I going to work from this job at 2 o'clock in the morning? And the answer was, that's the job. So who's your boss? I said, me. The first six months were a nightmare. Because for the first six months, every single penny that I made went to this boss, $5,000 a month. After six months, I finally made my first $1,000, meaning I kept $1,000 out of all the money that I made. I finally made $1,000 for myself. To me, that was a million dollars. Because you work six months to finally make 1000 Now, at this point, I'm borrowing a dollar every day from my friend Dimitri because I didn't have any money. I needed a dollar to buy a coffee for 50 cents and a donut. I would sneak on a bus because I didn't have money to pay for the bus, 250 each way. You know, I had a, uh, you know, this is part of my kapa'at avonot, where I have so do chuvah still to this day, because every day I would sneak on a bus, steal 250. You know, when somebody goes up to Shemaim, they go up to Shemaim after 120, even if he kept Shabbat and he kept mitzvot and he kept everything, if he comes up over there to Shemaim to go to Ghanai, then say, oh, sir, do not enter. Why? You stole $2.50. You have to come back in a gilgul. Makes you think again before you want to steal. Even two fifty, you have to come back another gigu. Even two fifty. So now, Rabotai, at that point, I was struggling just to eat. Fifty cents was my food for the day. Sometimes I didn't even get the fifty cents. But it was hard and it was difficult. So when I got a thousand bucks, to me that was a million. To me it was everything. The next month, I got five thousand dollars. The next month I made seven. Next month I made eleven thousand. Next month I made seventeen thousand. In November of two thousand two, exactly a year after I started, or slightly over a year after I started, I made one hundred and seventeen thousand dollars in one month. I broke an office record. Everybody thought I was something special. I got a letter from the CEO of Raymond James. I was the new kid on the block. After that, everything changed. A bad month would become fifty thousand dollars a month. I started getting a lot of clients. Because I made people money when everybody else was losing it. I was calling them when their brokers were hiding under the desk. Because when somebody is losing you money, the last thing they want to do is talk to you. I was making the money in a bad market. And I was willing to answer their phone calls or even call them at midnight. Because that was my skill. I didn't know a lot. But I could work more than anybody else. So that's how it worked. After that, I'd start making more and more money. By August of 2003, two years after I started at this firm, Raymond James, I made my first million dollars. I became the number three top producing broker in the entire country for the firm that had about 5,000 people. And then I had to make a decision. Do I stay there or do I leave? Meaning start my own shop. I decided that it's better for me to fail at my own dream than to live fulfilling somebody else's dream. When you work for other people, in essence, you could do well, but it's their dream you're living. I didn't want to live somebody else's dream. If I was already going to make money, I wanted to make my own money. So I decided to go on my own, start my own shop, start hiring some people. In the beginning, it was difficult, but then after that, things got much better. Got to a point where on an average month, if it was just decent, $200,000, then $300,000, then $400,000. We just started printing money. By May of 2006, I made $1.6 million in one day. It got to a point where it was absurd. There was no shortage of money. There was only one problem. There was no point. You're all impressed like everybody else is impressed. It's success stories. You learn the Warren Buffett story or Michael Jordan story or anybody else's story. Wow, he has a house, he has a car, he has a this, he has a that. Little do we know that 99.9% .9 of all of those people are either suicidal or depressed or have no idea why they're even alive. Money is half the battle. It's something that helps you do stuff. 
You can buy stuff. Baruch Hashem, you can buy these amazing books. The books are amazing. The only thing is, the only way the books work is if you read them. If you just buy books, it's nice. You have a nice collection of books. But the good things about these books you have here at Shorashim, these books, if you read all of them, you definitely have Olam Abba. You definitely have a point in life. You're definitely going to succeed in life. Definitely. Now, if you go to a different library, like the public library, like the library of the Goim, you read their books, you definitely have no point. You're definitely going to miss life. You're definitely going to be depressed. Why? Because there's no point. And that's the problem. Most people live a whole life, 70, 80, 100 years, with no point. Because they thought, like I thought, that the point was to make money. After I made money, and money was no longer a problem, I get depressed. Why? There's no point. Okay, so I have the money. Now what? Okay, so you buy a bracelet, and you buy a car, and you buy a $4 million apartment on Wall Street, and I had an apartment on the 35th floor. My balcony alone was 400 square feet. The balcony on the 35th floor was 400 square feet. It's a big space. bigger than this almost. Actually, it's about the size of this. A little smaller than this. The balcony on the 35th floor. The apartment itself was 2,000 square feet. It's double the size of my house today. And that was an apartment today. I have a house. Big place. I had millions of dollars in the bank, in the market, clients. I was on CNBC, that stock market channel, if any of you guys know what it is. I was on Bloomberg. I was on CNN. I wrote articles and so on and so forth. I, I trained over 135 different people that worked for me, salesmen. I was the guy that knew how to sell anything. But... When it came to a point, when it came to a purpose, that I didn't have. So I'd look for things to do to keep myself occupied. My hobby was playing poker. I used to go play poker, and I was relatively good at the poker. I played at the World Series several times. I won a few tournaments in Las Vegas, in Atlantic City. I was the guy everybody wanted to play because I had a bunch of money. But then when they lost it to me, they didn't really want to play me anymore. And on the average weekend, I would put fifty to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars on the table, and I thought that was fun. But then after a while, that lost its fun. Why? There was no point again. Okay, so you win the tournament. Then what? Okay, so you win the cash game. Then what? What's the point? Am I going to do this for seventy years? Then what? What happens? And I realized little by little, there's no point to all of it. And I know it all sounds cool. You have a bracelet, you have a car, you have this, you have fun. But believe me when I tell you, when Shlomo HaMelech said at the end of Ecclesiastes, he said it several times actually, all of the good, all of the material in the world is Evel Avalim. It's all nonsense. Why? It's not going to give you a point in life. So I'm not saying go be homeless and collect uh, change and just uh, sit in a collar all day. The point is you have to have a point. There has to be a purpose. Now, since I was looking in the wrong direction, Hashem gave me different signs. In the book of Deuteronomy, Sefer Devarim, Hashem says that before the end of time comes, before the Mashiach comes, He's going to give an opportunity to every single person to do tshuva. The Rambam, Allah Shalom, says that every Jew that makes it through Gogu Magog, the last war, before Mashiach comes, every one of them will do tshuva. Meaning every one of them will be a Baal tshuva. But that's only the ones that make it. So who's going to make it? The ones that do tshuva before the war. Now, Hashem made a promise. That means Hashem is not kidding. That means Hashem says that I have to do it. If He says it, He has to do it. So that means that when He said you're going to have an opportunity to see the truth, but only if you look for Me and you look for Me with all of your heart and all of your soul. The problem is that most of us are too busy looking for money, looking for girls, looking for drinks, looking for hobbies, looking for sports, looking for this, looking for that. Everything except looking for God. So he gives us a hand. He gives us messages. Sometimes the message is a problem with your job. Sometimes it's a problem with your uh, parents, your brothers, your sisters, your wife, your health, your finances. He gives you problems. That's how he talks to you. Because we're not Moshe Rabbeinu. He's not going to talk to us out of a burning bush. He has to talk to us to our life experiences. So if a person pays attention and he realizes that everything in the world is run by the boss, by Hashem Barach. Then he's going to realize, oh, this flat tire, there's a reason for it. I got a flat tire. What's the point? There's a reason for it. Maybe Hashem is saving my life. 
Maybe if I didn't have a flat tire, I would continue driving, and it was an accident across, you know, ahead of me, and I would die. So he's actually doing me a favor. Yeah, but now you're going to miss an appointment. No. You miss an appointment theoretically, but in reality, he's saving your life. So there has to be good in it. But if you're not paying attention to the signs, and Hashem gives you different problems and different tests, and you don't pay attention, then He gives you more difficult signs. So in November of 2006, I decided that I'm going to have an elective surgery, meaning a surgery I didn't have to do. But there was something that annoyed me. It's called hemorrhoids. Hemorrhoids, you don't have to worry, only two-thirds of the population has it. Everyone has it. But not everyone necessarily wants to have a surgery. I had nothing to do with my life. I was, you know, money didn't have much of a point. So I wanted to just be perfectly healthy. Yes? Hemorrhoids is when you have a vein grow in your rectal area and it makes you very uncomfortable. Hard for you to sit down, hard for you to stand up. It's pain. It's a painful thing. Yes, don't worry. It's not, uh, you know, no one needs to make fun of it because it's actually something that two thirds of the human population has. If you don't have it, exactly, it's a pain in the butt. Whoever made that expression had hemorrhoids. <laughs> the point is, is that if you don't have it now, at some point you may have it, Hashem Yachem, but there are cures for it, Baruch Hashem. By the way, it's very common for pregnant women. Very common for pregnant women to get it during pregnancy. Now, some people, they have it temporarily, either because of their diet, the food that they eat, or because they have uh, stress or other things, but for some people, it's a chronic condition, meaning it continues forever. For me, it kept coming back every six months, and it was very annoying to me. So I decided that I'm going to have a surgery. I'm going to go to the doctor that was an expert and tell him, I want to get rid of this annoying problem. I don't want to have a pain in the butt ever. Not once, not twice a year, not ever. I want to fix it. I have money. How much do you need to fix the problem? I have to use this money for some reason. So he said, yes, no problem. We'll have the surgery. You come on a Wednesday, and uh, you're back to work on Monday. I said, okay, good deal. I came to the surgery. This guy is a professional, an expert in the business for almost two decades, almost 20 years. And he says he has three, four surgeries a day. It's a very common surgery. You have the surgery. You go home the same day. You feel a little uncomfortable when you go into the bathroom for a couple of days, but it's not the end of the world. Typically. I had the surgery. I woke up out of the surgery, but something changed. What changed? My whole body. Something changed in my entire body. Something went wrong during the surgery. They cut some type of nerve that even 13 years later or 12 years later, they still haven't figured out what it was, but something that changed up the entire makeup of my nervous system, of my whole body. I woke up from the surgery screaming and yelling my lungs out because what I felt wasn't a pain in the butt. What I felt was a pain everywhere everywhere my feet my arms my head everything everything hurt but hurt not like it hurt like you fell and you hurt your leg or you broke your leg hurt like I was on fire while I was being cut open by with a, with a dagger that kind of hurt and electrocuted at the same time nightmare now they tried giving me morphine because they had no idea what was going on why am I screaming my lungs out but then they discovered that my body is not accepting this morphine they asked my wife if I was a drug addict And my wife says, no, I'm actually anti-drugs. I never took a drug in my life. I like my brain, and drugs ruin your brain. So I decided not to take any drugs. But now when I finally had to take drugs because for the pain aspect of it, it didn't work. My body rejected it. And they gave me more and more and more and more, and eventually got to a point where they told my wife, listen, we just gave him the most amount of morphine legally allowed, which would kill most people. After this, we can't do anything. If it doesn't work, there's nothing else we can do. Hashem had mercy on me, Baruch Hashem, and it worked, it calmed me down. After that, they said, okay, we have no idea what just happened, sir, but you're calm. Go home. At, at the end, it's, it's, an elect, it's an elective surgery. It's not like a heart surgery. It's not a, a brain surgery. It's an elective surgery, superficial surgery on some skin. I said, okay. I went home. We got a shawarma sandwich on the way home. Ate the sandwich. Told everybody it was a very interesting day. If there was ever uh, any teachings that someone told me about this place called Gehenom, now I know what it looks like. I told them, okay guys, I'm going to sleep, good night. 
45 minutes after I went to sleep, I woke up with even worse pain than I had a few hours before. The only difference now is it didn't stop for 62 days. My body started failing for 62 days. The most amount of consecutive sleep that I can get was 15 minutes. And anyone that wants to test it, if you don't sleep for a while, you start dying. Your body starts failing. So my eyes started bleeding, my ears started bleeding, I started urinating blood, all types of fun things. The stuff that happens to people that are dying. And that's what the doctor said. He's dying. Why? We have no idea. Something happened, his body changed. We have, there's nothing we can do. So for those couple of wonderful months, life was hell. After two months, the pain started subsiding. It started slowing down. I only had to take 20 painkillers a day to survive. And then I had to say, okay, you know what? I have to go back to, I have to, go back to work. I have to go back to life. Now, yes, I'm in pain, but I'm not as much as the pain as I had yesterday or the day before or the day before. So let me start going back to life. Now, at this point, I can't really move really well because my whole body is in pain. It's not just the rectal area. It's everything. Why? We don't know. So to walk from there, from that door, to let's say the end of the room here, would take me somewhere in the neighborhood about 45 minutes. Finally, I got to the office, but now I can't really work so well. I'm either in pain or I'm half asleep because of all the painkillers. But I'm trying. After a little while, the pain slows down. I start getting back to myself. I start going back to making money. I start going back to rebuilding the business and then I feel a pain in my leg the next day I can't move I have to go to the emergency room they do some serious tests they say sir you have a abscess you have an internal infection in between two muscles and within a matter of maybe an hour or two, this infection would have exploded, gone into your blood system, and you would have died on the spot. An abscess is an internal infection. How old were you when you had the... 26. You're, you're making $1.6 million. Sorry, $1. 6 million. No, it was $1.6 million in one day. I know. So more than that. Yeah, for the, for the year, 26. Right, At 26 years old, my top year was $5 million. First year... 26 years old before the surgery by the time I got to the surgery I made five million dollars for that year that's what I took home not like what I made I made more than that but there's taxes and there's expenses and so on yes zero nothing I donate a lot of money I had Chabad guys come to my office every week and I'd give them a bunch of money once in a once in a few once in a while at late feeling I'd go to shul you know, during Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, I keep Pesach the best I could, meaning I wouldn't eat chametz. I didn't eat on Yom Kippur. But as far as Shabbat, as far as real kosher, no, I didn't work on Shabbat. I played poker on Shabbat. Or I watched movies on Shabbat. Or I went to the pool on Shabbat. Or I did all the other things that you're not allowed to do. Working is one of the things you're not allowed to do. There's a lot of other stuff you're also not allowed to do. Shabbat is so holy that the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says that you have to have special clothes just for Shabbat. Just for Shabbat, you have to have special clothes. That's how holy Shabbat is. Shabbat is so holy that you're not allowed to do anything that you do normally during the rest of the week. Why? Because it's Shabbat. It's a special day that Hashem created specifically for you. Why? Why did Hashem create Shabbat? Hashem says there's no way for a human being ever feel like me why because you're human you're the creation he's the creator so there's only one thing that can make us somewhat similar that will give you a good feeling what's that feeling I created for six days for six days Hashem took all of his creations and he put them together he put the Sun and the moon and the sky and the water and the, and the oxygen and the animals and everything he put them all into place over six days and on the seventh day he says this is the day I'm not going to create why? Because that's one thing you can also do. You could also not create. But what does it mean not create? Sleep all day? No. 
by not creating meaning you're not going to do all of the mundane things you did during the first six days and focus specifically on doing what is your goal what's your goal in life learn Torah and fulfill mitzvot that's your goal in life that's your goal in life that's why you came to the world it's not to play soccer it's not to make money it's not all the other things it takes a while for us to get this point though I didn't know this at this time I knew that there's something called Shabbat I actually kept Shabbat for about a year and a half when I was 17 I learned a little bit here and there you know throughout my life I went to a religious school when I was a kid up to about 10 years old so I knew what Judaism was but as far as keeping it I kept whatever made sense to me like most people today most people keep whatever makes sense to them if it doesn't make sense then they don't keep it so one of the things that caused me to go this way is because when I asked questions people didn't have answers so I asked somebody one time does the Torah believe in dinosaurs I asked a serious question first person I asked they said I don't know next rabbi I asked said I don't know third rabbi I asked, said yes yeah, sure I said where does it say it he goes I don't know so, I said, so you believe it but you don't know and I started asking questions that I was interested in I was interested in dinosaurs I was interested in UFOs. I was interested in money. I was interested in science. I was interested in that type of stuff. I asked questions. I figured that every rabbi is supposed to know. I didn't know that there's different types of rabbis. I didn't know that there's different types of knowledge. Just because you go to a certain rabbi and ask him about dinosaurs, and he doesn't know, doesn't mean he doesn't know anything. He just doesn't know about dinosaurs. He may know about Shechita. He may know about Tarat Mishpacha. He may know about Shabbat. He may know about other things. Just like if you go to a doctor. Go to a doctor, listen, I have a heart problem. Sorry, I don't know. What do you mean? What kind of doctor are you? I'm a dentist. <laughs> I'm a dentist. What do you want for my life? You go to another guy, you go to a dentist. He goes, Yeah, listen, I have a problem with my brain. I'm sorry. I'm a dentist. Uh, what, you guys don't know about brain? You don't teach you in medical school? No, we, they teach us what we know over there. We have a certain skill. I didn't know this. I was naive. I was young. And then what happened with Georgie also? So eventually we got to a point where we realized that this knowledge was something I needed to have. I realized it after the fact. So now the first surgery I had was a nightmare. I recovered. Nine months later, I'm back in the hospital. I'm having another surgery that's worse than the first. I'm now in intensive care unit for almost a month. Intensive care unit is usually where people die. Either live or die, 50-50. Guys that get shot, guys that get heart attacks. Intensive care unit is that at any given moment, somebody's dead next to you. And I was there for almost a month. After a month of being in intensive care unit, they released me eventually. I went back home. I went back to my life. Pain, agony, but things started getting better and better and better until six months later. Six months later, I have another pain. Different body part. I'm back at the hospital, another surgery. Another intensive care unit. Another nightmare. Released after another few weeks. I'm back home. Three months later. If you notice, the times keep getting shorter. Three months later, I'm back in the hospital. I'm back in the surgery. I'm back on painkillers. I'm back with the nightmare. Then it gets to a point where it's every single month. Every month I'm having either a surgery or something, and then it gets to a point where every week. Every week I'm in a doctor or a hospital at least two to three times a week. Eventually I get to a point where I become an experiment. Seriously, I become an experiment in a the lab. They actually start doing experiments on my body because they have no idea what's wrong. They have no idea why a simple surgery led to a body completely failing what does it have to do with your lungs what does it have to do with your liver what does it have to do with your kidneys what does it have to do with your everything else it has nothing to do with it i went since i had money i went to all types of doctors we went to over 50 different doctors just simply trying to diagnose it no one was able to figure it out not the traditional doctors not the special doctors not the holistic doctors no one and i had to live in pain and agony not for a month, and not for a year, and not for two. For seven years. Seven years of 24 hours a day, pain, surgeries, agony, nightmare. After seven years, I didn't really want to live anymore. But Hashem wanted me to live. Apparently, I went through the test, and it was time for me to realize what's the point. So one day, my mom decides to call a bunch of different rabbis to ask for a blessing. Because her son that donated a Sefer Torah and donated a bunch of money to the Beit Knesset 
and donated money to anybody that asked, doesn't really keep much. And he's in really bad shape, meaning me. And she know she knew that's not enough. So maybe we'll get a blessing from a rabbi. So she called a bunch of different rabbis, but on that day, no one picked up. She called for almost two hours all over the world. Any rabbi that pretty much existed, she called them. Eventually, she reaches a number in, in uh, Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem. A woman answers the phone. And she asks for a certain rabbi. But she says, I'm sorry, ma'am. Wrong number. There's no such rabbi here. My mom, since she's been dialing the phone for two hours, just looking for anybody to answer, starts breaking down and crying to the, wo- to the woman. She doesn't know who she is. But she's just crying, hysterical, because she's trying to reach a rabbi. She can't find a rabbi for two hours. Now, Hashem only gives you tests that you can handle. If you have a difficulty in your life, that means you can handle it. Apparently, my mom also got to a test. She got to her own limit. So Hashem had to make a miracle. What was the miracle? The woman on the other side of the phone, the wrong phone number, all of a sudden identified my mom's voice and called her by her name. Doris? My mom said, how do you know my name? She stopped crying. I wrote, it's a wrong phone number in a different country. How do you know my name? She says, well, I'm your niece. Niece? Who is your niece? I'm your brother and sister, Pnina. She goes, how did I get to you? I don't even have your phone number. I don't have your phone number. We've never spoken on the phone before in our life. They, they, they're related, but doesn't mean they're they connected. Plenty of us have relatives in different countries. Doesn't even know, doesn't mean anything. She called the wrong phone number. She reached somebody that's actually related to her. That person actually identified her voice, which by itself is a miracle of its own. And now we found out is the only person that can help too. Penina says, why are you crying? She tells her the whole story. She goes, oh yes, we all know about it. Your owner is very sick. But what are you looking for? She goes, I just need a blessing from a rabbi, from somebody. She goes, oh, well, why don't you talk to my brother? Rabbi Flaim. She goes, oh, will he talk to me? Yeah, of course. Tamit Chacham, he's uh, Bo Hashem. He uh, also lives a couple of doors down from Abu Vadia. Maybe he could pray for you, maybe connect you to the Rabbi Vadya, something, do something. She goes, okay, connect me. She calls Rabbi Ephraim, Rabbi Ephraim is at the Kola, learning Torah like he always does, Baruch Hashem. But then, Rabbi Ephraim calls her back. Rabbi Ephraim calls her back and she tells him the story. Now at this point, I didn't know that Rabbi Ephraim even existed. Because when I left Israel, I was 10 years old, Rabbi Ephraim was a baby, he was much younger than I am. I didn't know he existed. I didn't know he was my cousin. I didn't know he was in the world. So I asked, so my mom asked him, uh, you know, what we should do, what we should do. And right away, right away, yes, you want to get the pizza? You can get the pizza. It's fine. Enjoy. So right away, Rabbi Fahim got to the point. He asked him, does he speak Hebrew? Because he doesn't speak English. He says, yes, he speaks Hebrew. She says, okay, so can I call him? She goes, no, he's not going to talk to you. He's not going to talk to anybody. He's very antisocial. He's in a lot of pain. And at that very moment, at that very moment, she's telling him he's not going to talk to you. I decided to call my mom on the other line. As you can see, the miracles get bigger and bigger. I call my mom on the other line while she's on the phone with Ephraim. She's crying hysterical. She's telling me to talk to this guy. I have no idea why she's crying. I don't know. I'm getting into the middle of the story. Talk to him. Talk to him. I said, who? Why is he making you crying, this person? She goes, talk to Ephraim. Like, Who's Ephraim? She goes, he's your cousin. He's this. He's that. I said, okay, just stop crying. Have him call me. I'll talk to anybody. Just stop crying. It's, it's, it's like hell on earth hearing your mom cry. So, Rabbi Ephraim calls me. And right away, we hit it off. How you doing? How you doing? And then he's like, uh, he said, do you ever hear the story about you dying, Tamal? I said, I don't know who Yudai is, and I don't know who Tamar is, but tell me. So he tells me the story that's in the book of Genesis in Sefer Bereshit of the son of Yaakov Avinu that had two sons or three sons, Eren and Onan, that he wanted to marry, he wanted them to get married. So first, the first son married this tzaddikah named Tamar. Now Tamar had a prophecy. Prophecy means she spoke to Hashem in her own way through a dream or an epilepsy of some kind and she saw the future. And she saw that the Mashiach, the one that's going to save all of us after we all do tshuva, is going to come from Shevet Yehuda. It's going to come from Yehuda. 
So she wanted in. She wanted to be part of this family. She wanted to be part of the big mission. She wanted a purpose in life. She wasn't. She didn't care about money. She didn't care about Wall Street. She didn't care about lollipop. She cared about being part of the big mission, the ultimate purpose. She says, okay, I have to marry this El. I'll marry El. Looks mean nothing. Money means nothing. Why? I want to be part of the big mission, the boss's mission. But then El did something that's disgusting to Hashem. He did something called wasting seed. In today's world, it's called masturbation. In other words, he used his seed in order, to, instead of to bring children to the world, he used it for nothing. So when they were, were supposed to bring children to the world, he didn't want to have children. He didn't want to have children, which unfortunately for him is considered, according to our Shulchan Aruch, the biggest sin in the entire Torah, even for Goim. Why? Because according to the Gemara Masechet Nida, if anybody wants to see it, the Gemara calls wasting seed 100% murder. Just like you murdered somebody in cold blood, you shot him in the face, and you killed him, wasting seed is the same thing. Only difference is, instead of killing one person, you kill 300 million. Because the average, the average person ejaculates 300, different se- 300 million different seeds. Now, Rabotai, most of you probably didn't know this until now. Neither did I. Now, the other thing that this wasting seed is, it's also one of the ways that a person can lose all of their money. Hashem says, I'm going to give you shefa. I'm going to give you good. Now, the good is going to come in multiple ways. It could be money, it could be kids, it could be wife, it could be th- a lot of stuff. But you can lose all of it by your seed. If you use the shefa that I give you the right way, you keep all the good that I give you. If you don't, I take it back. Because you're wasting the shefa. So you'll see many times people that go to the similar financial collapse that I did also wasted seed, either by being with women that are not their wives or other, other ways. So the first son wasted seed, so Hashem killed him. So then, Yehuda knew that Tamar was a tzaddikah. He says, you know what, why don't you marry my other son? Why don't you marry my other son? Because you haven't had kids yet. Why don't you marry my other son? So she married his other son, and he didn't know that his other son was also clueless about mitzvot, clueless about the Torah, clueless about what he's allowed and not allowed to do. So he also wasted seed. So Hashem killed him too. After that, Yudai and Tamar, as the story goes, Yudai and Tamar herself actually ended up getting married. She pretended to be a prostitute because she knew that Yudai wouldn't want to marry her in a normal way. But she wanted to marry him because she wanted to be one of the tools that Hashem is going to bring Mashiach. So she says, there's no way for me to marry Yehuda. And his, young, his the last, third son is too young. So he's not going to let me marry him, especially since the first two sons died. So she wants to be still part of the big mission. So she pretended to be a prostitute and fooled him because prostitutes in those days, they would cover their face. Not like today. So prostitutes in those days, the way you knew if someone's a prostitute is if they cover their face. So Yehuda didn't know. Long story short, you can read it from Sefer Bereshit. She fooled him into being with her, and then eventually it was discovered that she was the woman and she was pregnant, and one of the sons is actually going to be the way that we're going to get to the Mashiach. Now this was the first story. There's obviously more details to the story, but this was the first story that Rabbi Ephraim told me. Yes, you had a question? No, a mamzer, a mamzer doesn't come from lack of marriage. A mamzer comes from eshet ish. If somebody... No, if the first person she was married to died. So then she married the second son. He died. He died too. So then after that, she was with Yehuda. She was single. He was single. They were both widows. She was widow. Both of her husbands died and his wife died. So now they're allowed to get married. No problem. Especially at this point, since there was no, Hashem didn't give the Torah officially at this point. So there was slightly more, there was a lot more leniency to certain rules. So this was a permissible thing. This is actually what Hashem wanted to happen. The point being is that this was a wonderful story for me. This was because it was very, it was very creative. And I saw that Hashem's work is very miraculous, very creative, very amazing. So how Hashem made all of this happen because He needed to hide 
this whole story from the Satan. Because Satan, once the Mashiach comes, Hashem slaughters the Satan. So the Satan is doing everything possible to slow down the Mashiach from coming. So Hashem, every time there's a story that's related to Mashiach, you'll notice that it's a very unusual story. That's the way that Hashem is hiding from the Satan. Hiding the story from the Satan. Now, this was the first story that I heard from uh, Rabbi Ephraim. I liked it. I asked him for more stories. So he told me, what kind of story do you like? I said, I don't know. So I started telling him my, my problems. He's like, oh, it's a very interesting problem. Somebody else in the Torah had the same problem. And he tells me somebody else in the Torah that had the same problem. So then I started asking questions. And he said, oh, wow, that's a really good question. Rabbi so-and-so asked the same question 850 years ago in this book, on this page. And to me, I was like, what do you mean? How do you remember the book? How do you remember the page number? I, I thought maybe he just so happened to have the book right there. So then I asked another question. He said, wow, it's a really good question. Rabbi so-and-so asked the same question 350 years ago in this book on this page. And I said, what's the chances of him having both books for both of my questions? I didn't know that Talmidei Chachamim, the people that learn Torah, that's how they think. So I continued asking questions. I didn't even know I had that many questions. I asked about dinosaurs too. I got the answer. I'll give you the answer before the show ends. The point is, is that I saw that there's answers to everything. And he has it. We spoke for almost two hours. The next week, he called me on Thursday at 4 o'clock. We spoke for three hours. The next week, Thursday, 4 o'clock, we spoke for five hours. The next week, Thursday, 4 o'clock, we spoke for seven hours. And every week after that, every Thursday at 4 o'clock, my life would shut down because my conversation with Rabbi Fein would begin. Wall Street could die for me for all I cared. My health didn't mean anything anymore. I could be in pain. I could not be in pain. I could be busy, not busy. It didn't make a difference. At 4 o'clock, everything ends. Why? Life started at 4 o'clock on Thursday. I could start getting answers for questions that I had my whole life. Because now I started realizing there's a point. There's a point to life beyond money, beyond the pain, beyond everything else. Now, as I started finding out answers for the questions that I had, nine months worth of questions, I started realizing that the answers mean that I have a problem. Number one, I'm not keeping mitzvot. According to the Torah, if you look at Parashat Kitisa, which we actually learned recently, a few months ago, Hashem says that someone that's a mechalel Shabbat, mot yumat v'nicheta nefesh ayi mikerev amea. A person that violates Shabbat has some, a pasuk written about it 12 times in the Torah saying that you have death upon death and he's cut off from the nation. So I asked, I asked, what does this mean? What does it mean? How do you die twice? So the answer was, first death is a shorter life in this world. Second death means there's no Gan Eden, there's no Olam Abba. I said, okay, so once you die twice, you died here, there's no alarm about, then what? What's the cutoff from the nation? And the answer shocked me. The answer shocked me because the answer is that once a person's a Mechalel Shabbat on purpose, then he's no longer considered part of Am Yisrael. He's considered like an idol worshiper in the eyes of God. Why? Because the idol worshiper also drives on Shabbat. I said, yeah, but I feel like I'm a Jew. He says, feelings could be misleading. A lot of people feel things. Sometimes just guess. It's nothing else. Feeling means nothing. What are you doing? What are you doing with it? Point is, I'll tell you that I realized I have a serious problem. I have to start keeping Shabbat. And then I realized that the kosher that I thought I was keeping by not eating meat in non-kosher places wasn't enough. Why? Because even if I'm eating pizza from a non-kosher place, it's also meat. Because part of the sauce has meat in it. The non-kosher pizzerias use meat to create flavoring for their sauce. They also use meat to create flavoring for their cheese. That's why if you go to the supermarket, the regular supermarket, the kosher supermarket, you go to the regular supermarket, you'll see that there's four or five different kosher cheeses and there's like 500 non-kosher. Why are there so many non-kosher? Because the non-kosher ones use ingredients that we're not allowed to use as Jews. Mainly meat. Different types of meat, usually pork. So when you eat non-kosher pizza, not only are you eating non-kosher meat, you're also eating milk and meat. So then I realized that my kosher wasn't kosher enough. My Shabbat wasn't enough. 
And then I realized there's another problem. I'm also married to a woman I'm not allowed to marry. She's not Jewish. Now, how do you tell somebody to stop being not Jewish? Convert them. You can't convert somebody if they don't want to convert. That's a fake conversion. Can't Because if somebody wants to be a Jew, then they're going to do it on their own. But if somebody doesn't want to be a Jew, if they have a belief, they believe in J.C. Penney. They believe in Jesus over there. The idiot that died 2,000 years ago. They go believe in him. They believe in Buddha. They believe in Muhammad. They believe in a cat. They believe in a rat. They believe in the monkeys like in India. There's different. There's 80 different sects in India. One of them published just last week. There's a new religion in India. There's a new religion in India. Their god is Donald Trump. I'm dead serious. Why? Because they wanted to, com they wanted to compete with a different religion. A different religion that uh, announced three weeks ago their god is a monkey. Why? Because the monkey stands in the middle of the street and everyone, saw, and he, and he, there's a video of this. People come up to him, he puts his hand on their head, and they walk away. They think he's giving them a blessing. Little do they realize he's just wiping his hand on their head. So, and then there's a bunch of them that believe in a cow. They believe in a cow because the cow carries their, uh, carries the, the, uh, the, in, the, no, carries their baby for nine months. They figure a human carries a baby for nine months. The cow carries a nine, baby for nine months. That must mean she's a god. A month, stupidity. Complete stupidity. No different than Christianity. No different than any other religion other than Judaism. And the reason why is because Judaism is the only one that has scientific proofs that it's real. But now to tell somebody to stop believing something is not possible. Because they believe it. You can't just, it's not like a, uh, hey, stop doing this. You believe it. You can't just stop believing something. So then I decided that the only way for me to help her was to find out if it's true. If Christianity is true, then I want to be a Christian. Why should I be a Jew if Christianity is true? But if Christianity is false, then not only am I going to run away from it, I'm going to help her run away from it. Why? Because she's the one that saved my life for the last seven years. She's the only one that actually helped me throughout my sickness. Why wouldn't I help her? So I started looking into Christianity, and little by little, I'll save you the time, I found out that not only is it nonsense, it's complete falsehood. It's idol worship. It's not only falsehood. It's idol worship. It's no different than worshiping a cow. It's no different than worshiping a Buddha statue, or a rat, or a dog, or anything else. It's idol worship. It's nonsense. It's no different than worshiping money which unfortunately many people do because they work so hard for money that they forget to serve God. That's also a form of idol worship. Now, at this point I realized it's idol worship, so I had to save her. So I started giving her information. Little by little she started realizing that this is true, but she needs more. So she started doing her own research. Eventually, I showed her a video by Rabbi Mizrahi, Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi, there was a debate between him and a Christian professor. Now, since the Yetzirah, Yetzirah does not want people to convert. Yetzirah does not want people to do, to do tshuva. And the reason why is because the Zohar Kadosh says that there are certain type of souls, there are certain type of souls that are very big, they're very significant, very important. The type of souls that are so big, so significant, they can bring the Mashiach themselves. Now, Everything that Hashem created, He created an opposite effect to it. In essence, meaning, like Hashem has Kisei kavod, He has a throne of glory, He also created a Kisei kavod for the Satan Himself. Hashem has power to create, but He gave the power to destroy to the Satan Himself also. Of course, with the permission of Hashem. Point is that everything has an opposite. Tall, short, light, d darkness, and so on and so forth. Now, there are certain souls in the world that the Zohar Kadosh say have so much power, they can bring Mashiach. But if Hashem just released them into the world easily, then it would be the end. So, he made a deal with the Satan. What's the deal? They're going to be your hostages. Those souls are going to be your hostages. Meaning that the only way they can be freed is through serious Mesirut Nefesh, major sacrifice. This is why you see some of the most important human beings that ever lived in history came from unusual circumstances. Moshe Rabbeinu, Itro, Rabbi Akiva, David Melech, Ruth, Rabbi Meir Balanes, 
and so on and so forth. Some of the greatest people that ever lived either came from unusual Jewish stories or conversion stories. Point being is that very unusual circumstances. Because in order for them to be released from a Satan, something had to happen. So Satan will get involved and do everything he can. So when I tried showing her the video by Rabbi Mizrahi, immediately she hated it. Not because of the facts. She hated it because she didn't like Rabbi Mizrahi. And she thought that the Christian guy was an idiot. She was right that the Christian guy was an idiot. But she didn't know that within time she'll become Rabbi Mizrahi's biggest fan. But at this point, we, neither one of us knew it. So she watched part one of the debate. She said, okay, it makes some sense, but I don't like it. I convinced her to watch part two. Okay, it's nice, but I still don't like it. Part three, she never watched. So now, I'm trying to give her other videos, other rabbis, other information. Rabbi Ephraim is trying to help us also, giving us more information, but it's very hard. The Satan is, hard, is fighting hard. Our life goes into a mess. We start losing all of our money during this time. Whatever money we didn't lose, we're losing now. My health starts getting worse. All hell breaks loose. We continue. Eventually, I discover another video by the same Rabbi Mizrahi called Torah and Science. And I told her, let's watch this. We both like science. We both like Torah. Let's watch Torah and Science. She goes, oh, it's this guy again. I said, yeah, don't forget about the guy. Let's just look at the facts. Fine. Watch part one. It's a three-part movie. Watch part one. After part one, we're both fans of Rav Mizrahi's. Why? It's amazing. It's information we never heard of. It's information that's provable. It's information that changed the way we looked at the world. So now, we want to go and watch part two right away. Part two wasn't working. We couldn't find a working video online. So then we skipped to part three. Part three is even more amazing than part one. Now my wife realizes that Christianity is complete nonsense, but she still doesn't know if the J.C. Penny guy is nonsense. The New Testament is nonsense, but maybe the J.C. guy is, maybe he's real. She still has a suffix. She still has a doubt. So later that night, she talks to Hashem in her own words. In Judaism, we call it Eid Buddha Dut. And she prays to Hashem. She says, Hashem, I only find this out later on. She says, Hashem, at this point, we learned already Torah for the last almost two years. And I realize that we're not allowed to be married. I'm not allowed to be married to Yaron. Yaron is not allowed to be married to me. Because he's Jewish and I'm not. The problem is that until now, I believed, uh, I was taught to believe that if I believe, if I don't believe in this guy, I have hell. And I was taught to believe that you cannot become Jewish. It's either you're born Jewish or not. That's what I was led to believe. So Hashem, if you really want me to become a Jew, I need something more. But if, I'm, if I can't become a Jew, then please kill me. And the reason why is because I know that I can't leave Yaron. She can't leave me. She loves me. And he's not going to leave me either. So since I don't want to ruin his Olam Abba, it's better off you just kill me Hashem. So she prays for Hashem to kill her. It's a very unusual prayer. Usually people pray to live. The next day, she wakes up in the morning. I was up all night studying. I find Rav Mizrahi part two working I give it to her I say listen let's watch part two she says fine we watch part two and part two has the sign has Hashem's answer in the book of Deuteronomy Hashem Yitbarach says to Am Yisrael that at the end of days before the Mashiach comes he's going to send us to the four corners of the world because we sinned. We sinned a lot. And instead of doing tshuva initially, instead of doing tshuva, what we're going to do is we're going to pray to false gods. The god of stone and the god of wood. Now this is very interesting because it's symbolic. God of stone, we know that's the stone of Mecca for the Muslims. God of wood, we know it's the wooden cross for Christianity. But this could just be simple coincidence. Then Rabbi Mizrahi in the, uh, in the video shows that this verse in the Torah 
also has something called Torah codes, which are hidden secrets within the verses that have the names of these false gods, both Christianity and the Muslim religion, are both in this verse and no other place in the Torah. For me, it was a very cool secret to find out, but for my wife, it was everything. On the spot, she says, okay, how soon can I convert? I'm taking on everything. Everything. No, whatever we have to do, we're doing it. I said, yeah, you have to cover your hair. Doing it. You have to be modest. We're doing it. Keeping Shabbat. We're doing everything. Why? Because now everything has changed. Why did everything change? Because now I know God said it. Now I'm going to ask you guys a question. One question only. Is a Jew obligated to believe in dinosaurs? You're saying no. You're raising your hand. Different question. Okay. I asked. You, let's answer this question. One question at a time. Is a Jew obligated to believe in dinosaurs? He's obligated to believe in dinosaurs. Why? How do you know dinosaurs is true? Where? We need a source. You can't just say it's in the Torah. Fine, okay, but I still I want to know where is there dinosaurs in the Torah? I need to know. Do you okay, okay, let's uh, let's do this. Hold on, hold on. All right, you know, show show of hands. Show of hands. Show of hands. Show of hands. Let's just do this easily because everybody talking, we're not going to hear each other. Okay, now show of hands. How many of you believe in dinosaurs that actually existed? One, two, three, four. Okay. You guys don't believe in dinosaurs? You believe dinosaurs existed or no? So what are those bones in the in museums? They're fake. You're right. They are fake. You're right. They are fake. Most of them are fake. But do we believe in dinosaurs? Most of them are fake. You still believe in dinosaurs? Okay. No, it's the bones. They're bones, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a dinosaur bone. Okay, so most of you believe in dinosaurs. Now, why do you believe in dinosaurs? Now, if all the museums, all the museums announced to you tomorrow in the news, Karim, all of the bones are fake. Do you still believe in dinosaurs? Yes. Why? Because they do it. Prove it. No, no, they, the ones that have the bones, the ones that have the bones, all of the museums have a unanimous meeting. All of them, they say, listen, all the bones we have, they're all fake. Meaning, there's no proof for dinosaurs. Do you still believe in dinosaurs? As a Jew? You're, belie- you, you're convinced because you like the movie. I'm asking you, is there actual substantial reasons for why you believe what you believe? Yes. What's it's the saying, reason? It's, 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 like saying, it's not even that. If something happened... That's weird, the Torah, right? Isn't that yeah. the original Torah that Hashem gave us? No, it is 100% the original one. No, no, but I mean, it's not the, the same exact one. That no, it's the same 101, just a different paper. Okay, that's exactly. Same words. Same no, no, no. They're, no, no, they're tell, no, no, how do you know it existed? They're telling you that whatever they had, was it's plastic. It's not real. Now do you still have a reason to believe in dinosaurs? What is your reason for believing in dinosaurs? I'll save you the time because we're running out of time. The reason for you believing in dinosaurs is because you're actually obligated to do it. Why are you obligated to believe in dinosaurs? Because it is in the Torah. Where is it in the Torah? Right in the beginning. In the beginning in Sefer Bereshit. In Sefer Bereshit. No, before Noah. Before Noah. In Sefer Bereshit, on the fifth day. On the f- you want to hear what dinosaurs are? Story with dinosaurs. <laughs> On the fifth day, Elohim <laughs> Sefer Bereshit says in chapter 1, verse 20, God said, Let the waters teem with teeming living creatures and fowl that fly above over the earth across the expanse of the heavens. And God created the great sea giants and every living being that creeps with which the waters teemed after their kinds. 
and all the winged fowl of every kind, and God saw that it was good, and he blessed them. So here is one of the most important things that a person needs to know. You must, over time, not right away, over time you must invest time in learning Sfata Kodesh. You must invest time in learning Hebrew. I see that you guys pray in Hebrew, Baruch Hashem. You're very good rabbis that teach you not only how to pray in Hebrew, but how to pronounce the words. And the reason why this is important is because the only way you're going to find out the difference between false and true is if you can see it yourself with your own eyes. I can tell you whatever I want right now. I can sell ice to an Eskimo. I'm a good salesman. But it doesn't mean it's true. You need to see with your own eyes. Now I'm going to show you with your own eyes that I just read to you that dinosaurs exist. And the reason why is because here, in the, if you just read the English translation, you have a mistake. Why? Because the English translation says that God created the great sea giants. But that's not what it says. The English translation, unfortunately, is wrong. What it says here is that Vayivra Elohim et taninim agdolim. Taninim agdolim means giant lizards. Giant lizards, by definition, is dinosaurs. No, a whale is not a lizard. A whale is not a lizard. Tanin in Hebrew is lizard. A reptile. Reptile, yes. Reptile, lizard. These are reptiles. So we have giant reptiles. Actually, it's a better word. Giant reptiles are in the Torah. What are these giant reptiles? They are, they are in the Torah. Now, so now hold on a second. What does this really mean at the end of all of it? What does it mean at the end of all of it? What it means is the following. What it means is the following. Now that we know that God said it, and not your own Uven, and not just a rabbi, and not just some speaker, and not just some science language, uh, uh, some science video, but actually God. God himself said it. Once you know God said it, everything changes. Why? Because now I have to listen. If God came to us by a miracle right now, and he showed himself to us now, and a bat call, a heavenly voice came out from the ceiling right now, from the sky, from the heavens, and says, Rabotai, you have to do from now on, one, two, three. Is anyone here, anyone here, even think twice about it and not do it? Or all oh, you're going to do it? Of course you're going to do it, right? Because God said it. Is anyone here say, you know what, God, I don't really feel like it? God came out a heavenly voice. A heavenly voice just told you from now on, you have to wear long sleeve shirts. Are you going to say, God, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hot. I don't like it. No, why? Because God said it. Meaning that once you know for sure that God said it, it changes value. It changes, the, the, it's, the price is different. Now, if you go to a restaurant and there's no price on anything, what are you going to do? You're going to order everything. Why? Looks like it's free. But once the waiter says, no, no, sir, turn the, turn the menu around, and then you're going to see the price, and you see that the average price for the steak is $150. All of a sudden, you're not hungry anymore. All of a sudden, you're not hungry. All of a, not only you don't want anything, you don't want anything at all. Oh, can, can I have free water? You have free water. Why? Because now you realize the price has changed. The price has changed. Once you know God said it, once you know God said it, the price changed. Now that you know that God said dinosaurs exist, the price changed. But what does it mean also? It also means that now that we know that God, when he says something, it changes the value, we also have to find out what else did he say. Now in this week's parasha, Hashem Barach says to Am Yisrael that if they're going to sin with non-Jewish girls, if they're going to sin by idol worship, if they're going to do anything similar to idol worship, like be a violator of Shabbat, he's going to kill them. And we learned from the end of this parasha when Am Yisrael decided to, that they like these non-Jewish girls. Maybe they're going to convert them. Maybe they're going to hang out with them. Maybe they're just going to date them for a little while. So now, Am Yisrael goes with these women and we see at the end of the parasha that Hashem brings a plague and kills 24,000 of Am Yisrael 
almost to the point that he almost killed everyone. And the only reason he didn't kill everyone is because Pinchas ben Elazar ben Aaron Cohen killed the original sinner. And everyone got the point, and they all stopped. Cosby and, and Zimri and Cosby. A woman who was Cosby and Zimri was the man. Zimri was the head of the Shimon tribe. He was the first one that sinned with the Goya. And after they all saw him, after they all saw him, they thought it's allowed. After they saw a rabbi make a sin, they thought it's allowed too. They didn't realize that it's not allowed. So they, did, he, they saw him make a sin, so they did the same thing. They saw him talking in the shul, so they talked in shul. They saw him stealing, so they stole. They saw him doing wrong, so they thought it's allowed. So they did it also. Hashem says, not only is it not allowed, but if you continue, I'm going to punish you. Because I said it earlier in the book. Just like I said dinosaurs, I also said you're not allowed to be goyot. I also said you're not allowed to violate Shabbat. I also said you're not allowed to eat non-kosher. I also said you're not allowed to be with your wife, with your own wife when she's not pure. I said a lot of things you need to know. Why? Because that changes the price. The price is that if you violate Hashem's word, there's a cost to it. It's expensive. I didn't know it until it was almost too late. I almost died. Now, by the time we realize that God said all these things, I realize that I have to become religious. My wife realized she has to convert. We converted. We did tshuva. We changed our life. We didn't know that Hashem is just going to make miracles for us. We just thought, well, just gonna, hopefully He's going to forgive us because we're trying. Now, I'm still sick at this point. So Hashem wants to give you signs that He likes you. Sometimes they're small signs. Sometimes they're big signs. Now the day that they, after we studied and we met with the Bedin and so on and so forth, I said, you're going to convert on such and such date. We're very excited. And we knew that we can't waste any time. Now, now that we're learning Torah, now that we're following Torah, we cannot be in the same house at this point unless we're married. So we decided the same day, same day she's going to convert, we're also going to have a chupa the same day. We can't waste any time. We don't have any time to plan, not for parties, not for nothing. All we need is a couple of witnesses that are kosher, a minyan, finished. We're going to do kosher wedding, kosher people. Why? Because we have a lot of making up to do. We messed up for enough time. So we go and we plan, we're going to have this. Problem is, problem is, I'm in my 30s at this point. At this point, Rabotai, I didn't know that Hashem was going to throw me a curveball. What was the curveball? He gave me another infection. The infection got so big that I knew that as soon as we finish, I could barely walk, I could barely move, I was in an enormous amount of pain, but I knew I'm not missing this bed dean appointment. She has to convert, we're not going to say, listen, but I said to her, honey, we can't, even though we have this plan to get married right after this, we can't. Why? I have to go to the emergency room. I have to go to the emergency room and have a surgery. Five minutes after the, uh, after the conversion is finished. Why? Because I'm dying again. Okay, fine. Not so exciting anymore. So we go. Bedin, they ask her questions. They're very impressed of how much knowledge she has. Baruch Hashem. She passes the test. We're all excited. They say, okay, now you have to go to a mikveh. You have to, the final step of the conversion is to go to a mikveh. You go in. Christina, you come out, come out Sarah. You go in. Steve, you come out Yaakov. You come out Kodesh. You come out like a baby. The Rambam says that a person that converts is considered like a newborn. is a newborn baby. Now, she goes into the mikveh. I'm, before she goes into the mikveh, I'm in an enormous amount of pain. I'm containing myself, not to scream. She goes into the mikveh. All of a sudden, my pain stops. Now, I can't, I'm, I'm, not, I'm too excited to think, why is the pain not there? All I'm thinking is that she's Baruch Hashem, she's converted, and we're going to the hospital. But now, she comes out, we're excited, we call Rabbi Ephraim, and then I realize, I'm like, wait a minute, I don't have any pain anymore, so why go to the hospital? Let's go get married. Let's go have the chupa. She goes, really? When I go to the hospital? I said, no, I don't have pain. If I don't have pain, I went away, who knows? I'm not going to complain. So, okay, fine. We go back to... The room, I said, okay, let me change. I go to the bathroom, I undress, and I see that my entire body is full of blood. 
How? Surgery was done a different way. Usually the surgeries, I had to go to the hospital. They had to cut me. It was very, very painful. They had to leave the, the, the cut open because they have to let the infection come out so they can't stitch it up. Very, very painful nightmare process. This time, somebody else did the surgery, and it didn't hurt. This time, the pain went away on its own. I should just want to make sure that I knew he's running the show. Our life has been full of miracles since that day. At that point, I realized that not only is Hashem running the show, but he's happy with what we're doing. So we decided that we're going to invest more and more time into getting other people, just like you, just like me, to realize that there's much more important things in life than money, than girls, than drinks, than steaks, than pizza, than all of the material world that we chase our whole life. There's much more important things. Most important thing is to find out if God said it. If God said it. Why? Because once you know He said it, the price changes. Once you know He said it, you have to do it. So Rabotai, the most important lesson today is to give you a little bit of chizuk to realize that your number one job in your life is to find out what did God really say. Those books behind you, they're not just for show. They're not just for the show. They're for you to read them. The rabbis bought them for you so you can read them. Why? Because that's what God said. In those books, that's what God said. Once you know what he said, you can win in anything in life. Even if you want to go into the business world. Even if you want to be a, a professional in something. Even if you want to be successful with money, successful in marriage, successful in, with kids, successful in anything. Why? Because the Torah is ora'a. Torah is instructions. Instructions of how to win in life. In everything. You don't have to be a rabbi that speaks to the world and so on. You can be a regular Jew that works and eats and drinks and has a family, has a wife, has kids and so on. But at the very least, at the very least, you have to know what's the point behind all of it. What's the point behind all of it? Once you know the point behind all of it, then you have an instruction set to follow. That instruction set is going to tell you how to do what you want to do. And if you're allowed to do it, it's going to tell you right and wrong. Am I allowed to do this? Am I not allowed to do this? If I'm allowed to do it, how am I allowed to do it? If I'm not allowed to do it, why am I not allowed to do it? If I'm allowed to get a haircut, good. What kind of haircut can I get? Can I get a haircut where I shave my sides like the goyim? Or can I get a haircut where everything has to be number two? Oh, number two. Why? Because the Torah says that you're not allowed to shave your head. God said it. Not the rabbi. God said it. So the point is, it's important for us to know what God said. Once we know, that means that we're going to follow the rest of what he says. And we're going to be able to win. And you're not going to have to have the same test I did. Because my test is very painful. And like I told you, right now we're in the last generation. Mashiach's going to come any day. Could be next week, could be next year, could be 10 years. Either way, the point is the Mashiach is coming. We have to be ready before he comes. Because once he comes, time's out. Game's over. No more tshuva. We have to do tshuva. We have to get closer to Hashem and know what He said and do what He said before He comes. Why? Because when He comes, we need to be ready. It's game time. So Bezat Hashem just gives all of us a little bit of chizuk to at least spend more time finding out what God said. After you know what He said, then you do it. And Bezat Hashem, you'll have a wonderful life here in Olam Abba. Yes? Yeah, guys, it's time for Q&A now. Go ahead. Oh, I don't know. I like that. Q&A. Q&A. How about? Guys, guys, sit down. Guys, come on. Go, go. You could, you could, uh, go, go. How about? They want to beat. Can, can, can. You guys are jumping. I got it. I got it. Go, ask the question. Yes. 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 Kind of says the same thing, but it's not the same thing. So I'll give you an example. Now, the first religion, the first religion that ever that ever was ever created, organized religion. First organized religion 
is Judaism. Before Judaism was born, the only thing that was around was uh, idol worship. People praying to statues and things like that. After that, Christianity was born, almost 1500 years after Judaism. And after that, about 500 years later, it was uh, Islam. Now, no, th no, no, this is historical proof. Everybody knows that the Christianity is, came after Judaism because Christianity, they called their, huh? About 1500 years after Judaism. 1500 years. No. And then 500 years later, this is historical facts they agree with. Now, both Christianity and the Muslims, both of them believe that the Torah is real and they call it the Old Testament. They call it the original book and they say that their religion in Christianity, the New Testament, in uh, Islam, the Quran, they say that their book is the second part. So our Torah is the first part. Their book is the second part. They believe that the Torah came from God in Mount Sinai. And, but they also believe that their New Testament or the Quran also came from God. Now, the, so, one thing that we all agree with, both the Jews, the Jews, the Christians, and the, uh, and the Muslims all agree that the Torah came from God. Everybody agrees the Torah came from God in Mount Sinai. Everybody agrees. No one disagrees with it. So that's already... No, so here's the thing. No, they all, they all, they all agree that the Torah itself is real. Now they say that their, their second book, their New Testament, is a continuation of the Torah. The Jews are saying it's not. It's not a continuation. It's a nonsense. So how do you prove it? The way you prove it is that if you're saying that your second book is a continuation of the first book, that means that the two books need to agree with each other. Meaning that if the first book says that there was Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, those were the forefathers, if your book says there was Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and Steve, that's a problem. Why? Because you're contradicting the first book. If the first book says, uh, Av, you know, Yaakov came down to uh, Egypt with 70 people. How do I say the Old Testament is wrong? So here's the thing. An Old Testament is not wrong because no one says it's wrong. Everybody agrees it's right. The key here is to, is to prove if the New Testament is right or wrong. The way you prove it is by seeing that there's mistakes in it. So there are mistakes where you see that the New Testament contradicts the Old Testament. And it's not possible. New Testament was written by people. It wasn't written by God. I'm saying that Jesus was a sinner. He was not a righteous person. Right. He didn't... Christianity was created between 70 to 300 years after he died. Meaning Jesus himself never created Christianity. Jesus was actually a Jew that was a sinner, a very big sinner. No, it's, it's, it's an actual fact. It's, these are historical facts. No, he doesn't believe he's a sinner. But he knows that Christianity was created after Jesus died. It wasn't during his life. During his life, he, he, he was a Jew. Christianity was, born, was created after he died. But the point is, is that you'll see in this movie and other things that I could show you, you'll see that the... New Testament has mistakes in it. Yes, let's see. New Testament has mistakes in it. It's a CD. You put it in a computer, put it in the car. Uh, or you could uh, go online. You could just type in my name, type in the name of the lecture, and you'll see it on YouTube. Uh, huh? Oh, Torah and Science. Hey, that's one of the DVDs that I'll give you. Torah and Science, the Rabbi Zrahi uh, CD. He has it with him. I'll give it to you. So the point is that you have to see if there's mistakes. Once you see there's mistakes in the New Testament, then you see, then you know for sure... If there's mistakes, there's no way that it's from God. Because God doesn't make mistakes. So once you see there's the mistakes in a book, then you see that it's not divine anymore. So we see that there's no mistakes in the Torah, but there are plenty of mistakes in the New Testament. There's plenty of mistakes in the Quran that prove that they're fake. Let's say I'm talking to a Christian, right? And I want to prove it that the Christian is wrong. No, it's not. No, no, I'm saying, no, I'm saying, I'm good, I'm good. I'm saying. Still win. That's said. That's said. Go ahead. Can can. If you have a guy that you want to prove that Christianity is wrong. By God. No, no. Old Testament is 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 also another name for the Torah. New Testament is. is 
No. Old Testament is the Torah. It has nothing to do with Jesus. New Testament is all about Jesus. Yes. Right. So what you have to do, the best thing to do is to give him a lecture that somebody that's a professional talks about and proves to him that his religion is fake. So the way you could do it is by either giving them that Torah and Science DVD or the debate. There's several things. If you send me a text message, I can send you a few different things. You can give to this person. And if they learn it, they'll see clearly that their religion is complete nonsense. And they may actually even want to convert to Judaism. There could be seven Noahide laws, but the point is that many of them usually want more than just so Noahide laws. Either way, if you, are, if you have uh, people that you care about that are not Jewish, there's no problem with you sharing that information with them. It's actually a mitzvah. Yeah, Noahide. Noahide. You have to keep the seven Noahide laws. Okay, seven Noahide laws, yeah. So, Beseda Rabotai, the school of mitzvot, Baruch Adonai Leolam, Amen ve Amen.